Hello, Mage fans. This is Terry Robinson, your host at Mage the Podcast. And before we get to today's interview with Victor Kinzer about hyper-economics and primal utility, I have some community notes. First, we have finally answered a long-running question in the Mage fandom. What is the best way to kill a vampire? The answer is apparently Kickstarter, because Technocracy Reloaded has killed Cult of the Blood Gods and buried it in the backyard. For the most funded Old World of Darkness non-core Kickstarter, I understand that's a bunch of qualifiers, but you know what? I'm going to take this victory where I can. Number two, there are some new Storyteller Vault supplements available on StorytellerVault.com, where if you use the link in our show notes, Mage the Podcast gets a little bit. First is Satoris Filbricado's Mage Made Easy, which is an attempt to provide a easy on-ramp to Mage for players. I haven't read it yet, but I look forward to it. Number two. Changeling Countless Dreams is available, which is a nearly 170-page book on changelings in space and answers the vital question of, what if the xenomorphs from the Alien franchise were just kith? If you want something terrifying to shove in the deep umbra, I recommend flesh-eating space fairies. Also, we recorded this interview in, like, November. The fact that Victor and I talk about pandemics is strictly coincidental. Or is it? On with the show. So, Victor, how you doing? I'm doing well. I am... Super busy, but I am spending more time role playing than I have in a while, and that's awesome. And excited to dig into the syndicate. What are you role playing these days? So right now, I am playing in a biweekly Star Trek Adventures game, and I am running a weekly Changeling game set in the Great Depression, which is wacky and hard to like keep my head around my players. But it's a really fun setting. I'm enjoying it a lot. Oh, that's fascinating. I am for the first time in I think the past three years or so, not running a Mage the Ascension game. And I have two other games going. I have a Blades in the Dark game going, and I have an Invisible Sun game that's about to start. And I feel like I've abandoned my former partner or something like that. And I need to get like a Mage game back in my life, even if it's like play by post. That way I don't start getting like the shakes or something from being separated from wonderful, but not quite (laughs) sensical magic systems. So we're going to be talking about the Syndicate and hyper economic. So easy question. What's hyper economics and primal utility? So hyper economics existed in the game before primal utility. It was a concept that goes all the way back, I, I think, maybe to first edition. Maybe it wasn't mentioned till a little later when they got into more technocracy specific writing, but it is the dirty secret is it's economics. <laughs> of of all the paradigms I've gotten into. Hypereconomics is the one where I read the most outlandish, ridiculous things that it can do and manipulating societies and countries and shifting resources. And then I actually learn about how economics works. And I'm like, no, that that's just how this works. This is just a thing. I feel like in my investigation, the big difference between economics and hypereconomics is economics answers the question or tries to of what is the most efficient way of distributing finite resources when demand outstrips supply uh, versus hyper economics where it hones in on how does one deal with systems to sate desires where like in traditional economics we kind of use money or given good as a proxy for human wants where in hyper-economics, it seems like they're trying to get more down to base concerns, which is odd because at that point, hyper-economics should just be like, how do we get as many people E as humanly possible? But that <laughs> that, that, that was my attempt at, at parsing the syndicate revised thing, especially when they're like, prime utility. We don't actually know what it is, but it works. Oh, yeah. So primal utility is a whole expanded thing. I, I like that distinction. And I think it does get to the difference between paradigm and mage and the things in the real world that paradigm are based off of is the difference between this is how we observe something works. This is how we know something works in the real world, as opposed to mage, which is, it isn't just how it works. I can make it work this way. And I guess hyper economics is a little more active. Economics is the study of how systems of value interact with desire. Um, There was a book I read oh gosh, close to a decade ago now. I don't even want to think about that. And it was called The Logic of Life. And it was all about game theory and economic theory, but not applied to money, applied to all of the other decisions we make. And why do terrible, incompetent people end up staying in positions of power and offices? And why are all of these things that everyone agrees should change so unchangeable? And it's because 
you know, they're big and no one person really ends up feeling like it's their responsibility to change it. Everyone has to change it. And that's hard to do. That is the reader's digest notes of the reader's digest notes of that book. But like, those were the concepts that it dove into. So kind of like the notion of collective action, the fact that the Soviet state was not powerful enough to subjugate everyone. Like if during a mass demonstration, everyone had just thrown their pocketbook at uh, Nikita Khrushchev or Joseph Stalin, the, the regime would have had its head cut off, but that kind of collective action problem is super hard. Yeah, it is. It's, it's really hard. And that's a whole, oh God, we could do a whole episode on that and we wouldn't talk about Mage. But that book got me thinking in those modes and being really curious about that. So when I sort of came back to Mage, I read that during a bit of a, a break in my role playing where I just didn't know other people to role play with for a few years. And then it came back and the first of the revised convention books that I bought was the syndicate one. So yeah, the first of the revised convention books that I bought, I've I've read all of them now, but the first one was the syndicate one and I kind of fell in love with them. And I think it kind of goes back to that logic of life book because the technocratic union broadly is we are going to architect the world full stop. We're going to tell you what's right and you're going to, you're going to like it. And then the syndicate book, I remember the statement that pulled me in, and it's kind of at the core of hyper-economics is, we think humans should be humans, and we have faith in them being what they are, and they just want to be happy, and that works for us. We can work with that. And I feel like that's kind of the core of hyper-economics, is we don't need to tell you how to be. We can just very subtly make what you already are into what we need. And it's not a huge difference in perspective, but it's enough to make a difference. And I don't know why, but it's always hooked me. It seems terribly insidious. I I always had a romance with the syndicate because everyone recognized their importance. And it was one of those things where if you don't like us, it's because you probably don't like yourself. It was one of those things where a lot of the criticism heaped upon them seemed to be a case of projecting, or at least that's always how it felt to me, where it's just like, we are literally efficiently providing people with the things they want and improving their quality of life. Why would you yell at us for it? And it was also one of those things where one of the arguments I have is like, to me, the syndicate is the only aspect of the technocracy that is really aligned with the wild, like in the metaphysical Trinity, Mm -hmm. uh, to me, they are most aligned with dynamism because anytime you have a very complicated system that has internal feedback loops that is managed well with no centralized organizational principle, that always struck me as being a case of something being inflected with the wild, like nature is fundamentally fundamentally inflected by the wild, where you can also take the same reading of being like, oh no, there's this inevitable pull. There's a high a trophic hierarchy where you have basal organisms that are consumed and you have this food chain with an obvious direction to it. And that's a thing of the weaver. And I always, they always struck me as the one aspect of the technocracy that was comfortable in chaos and could use it well. I think that's mostly true. I think believing that entirely is something the syndicate wants you to believe in game. Okay. Because again, when you get farther into the syndicate and even into economics in the real world, you get centralized banking, you get fractional reserve banking, you get, you know, even if you go into a portion of the syndicate that I think is inevitable with the syndicate, but gets ignored a lot, trade unionism. Like how do you go from medieval high guilds to modern organized crime and not organ or through the labor movement? I don't know. But when you get into the parts of that that are more syndicate-like, so they're really big unions, not the little local ones that are more coordinated labor movements, but are more like, I've I've heard some horror stories from friends who work for really, really centralized unions, and they actually don't have much voice. Like AFL-CIO or? Um, The ones I've heard uh, are Teamsters. Um, Not that the Teamsters are always like that, but the particular locals they work for basically deferred to the national organization entirely. Got it. Their leadership board was not made up of made up of employees. All of the organization and paid work were from representatives from the national union. Like mm. they described it, and I went, "That does not sound like a union." Yeah, <laughs> and I've been on the union board. Like I'm, I come from a union family, but my experience was the board was made up of people working in the the bargaining unit. All the decisions were made by for the bargaining unit, and national was only called in occasionally if we needed some help. And it was totally different. So like, I think there's a breed of trade unionism 
it becomes very syndicate-like. And so I do think they are way more comfortable with chaos than the rest of the union. But I think they want everyone to believe that totally free market fairy tale, when in truth, they've secured more of the levers of power of that system than they really want to admit. So it kind of sounds like you're setting up a, they are fine with the game being a free for all, except for the fact that they have picked the referees, they've picked the rules for the game, and they've picked the landscape on which the game is being played. So as someone within the game, it kind of seems fair. But as mages, we get to look at the context in which a structure is being perpetuated. And maybe from that point of view, they're kind of just bullshitting everyone. Yeah, I think there's definitely an aspect of that, you know, and as with everything mage, how much of that is true depends on your game. Yeah. <laughs> you <Yeah>. know, <laughs> you are much more familiar with Sorcerer's Crusade than I am. Does hyper economics come out of a precursor philosophy or is it a natural extension? Where did the intellectual heritage of it come from? So this is interesting, and I will just give a full disclosure that I am one of the writers on Victorian Mage, so I'm going to actually have to leave some holes in this description. But if you go back to Sorcerer's Crusade, the precursor to the Syndicate is the High Guild. And the High Guild were the really organizational aspects of trade guilds from the Dark Ages. You have the Artificers and the Craft Masons who represent the actual labor, the actual people doing the work that you would think of, you know, from the various trades, the High Guild really represented the organization and the merchants and the money. And the High Guild is where Ars Cupidite comes from. And Ars Cupidite is the art of desire. It's of making someone want what you want them to want. It's understanding their desires and so being able to play them. And all of that started with the High Guild. And I don't know that the High Guild was ever working at a scale similar to hyper economics. They were definitely manipulating markets, but like the Silk Road or the the trade routes that eventually went, you know, bypassed Venice to go around Africa. I used that as a major plot point in one of my games where they put all of this effort into opening those trade routes because it would fundamentally reorganize, you know, primal energy and the nature of the world. And it wasn't just oh, cool, we have another way of getting to India. It was more fundamental. So I like Sorcerer's Crusade having some aspects of that. But if I'm going to be honest, most of the precursor to hyper-economic tidbits that I folded into my Sorcerer's Crusade game, I had to pull out of Wikipedia and history texts. They weren't necessarily right there in the Sorcerer's Crusade books. Yeah, and then you get a little bit later, and there's a mention in, I think it is the revised storyteller's guide about the invisible exchequers and the invisible exchequers there isn't a lot of history already published about them but they were sort of a stage between the high guild and the modern syndicate and the feeling i got from that little snippet and it is a very brief piece of text is they were meant to be really where hyper economics was born. So the high guild was playing markets. They were all about trade and money and desire and wealth, but they weren't necessarily in the books thinking on that global removed systematic scale. The invisible X checkers were meant to be that stage where the paradigm morphed into that, but there isn't a lot out there about them right now. So you talk about how establishing a alternative trade route to Asia fundamentally changes the world. And as a mundane person on the mud ball, I see how that changes things where, oh, okay, we have this secondary open trade route. We found a good way to navigate around the Cape of Good Hope. This gives secondary options. We no longer have this monopoly or or intermediary within the market. We can now work around this person. How does that magically then change the world? So the way I used that in my campaign, um, I had a campaign set in Venice in 1501, which is several decades before that route was opened. And my players decided to play, you know, it's always sunny in Venice and because the game was set in Venice and they just decided we're going to burn this thing to the ground and did what players tend to do in games. And I had a situation where the traditions and the order of reason were on more terms, but there was an open dialogue there, um, which is something that comes up in the Order of Reason book. There was more of a dialogue between the groups than modern mages realize. And 
when things started to go wacky, the NPCs who were working with the players at least a little bit said, look, guys, you need to rein it in or everything we are is going to be destroyed. You're not going to have any prime. This city is going to literally rot around us. We know what's coming and you need to knock it off. The players refused and I went, cool, okay, that trade route's going to happen 50 years earlier. And so Venice becomes irrelevant and the pathways through that part of the world become irrelevant. And in the world of darkness terms, these very specific tradition strongholds become irrelevant. And this major existential threat, which the players had become, becomes irrelevant. And I also tied it into stuff that was going on with the Borgias at the time. Um, and I, I was representing the Borgias as wrapped up with Gabrielites. And, you know, if you step back and don't just look at what's obvious on paper, you know, yeah, okay, it gives, it gives new options in terms of trade, but it also takes options away. It atrophies and rots certain parts of the world that maybe the Union or the Order of Reason, the Daedalans, wanted rotted at that point. And this gets into the like... Union slash Daedalans as conspiracy theory, those things always happen when a major change like that takes place. And, you know, most people will say, okay, that stuff's unpredictable. Like there's no way to know that that's going to play out that way. You, you can't pull those levers intentionally. It's too complicated. But the whole premise of mage and hyper-economics is, but actually you can. And that's what differentiates the magic of hyper-economics from the real world where that stuff is too chaotic to accurately predict. So hyper-economics, or, or I guess you could say uh, primal utility at the time, was kind of the ability to more thoroughly estimate and predict the historical events that would occur as a byproduct of an action? A market action, okay. I would say. It's definitely limited to the paradigm of market, but yes, I would say that's a major aspect of it. Okay, so you cut off trade to an area, and not only does the area suffer economically, but it suffers culturally. It drops out of prominence, its members... Uh, the people there, the royal family or the lead families, drop in terms of prominence. And rather than going in guns blazing and, and, and killing a group of people, you've merely made them irrelevant. And the idea here is this has a literal effect, but it is also something that has been impacted and manifest magically. Like literally to a certain extent, this is a large woven effect where people are no longer on the top of people's minds. Maybe that would have happened normally, but now this can be magically magnified in the city in more than just one way has been rendered irrelevant. Yeah, absolutely. And, and to kind of tie into primal utility, it also has the potential to dry up nodes. You know, nodes are described in, in the most traditional, you know, verbena circles as being these lines of power in the earth. But truth be told, if you take paradigm out of it, they're just lines of energy. They're flows of energy. If you take a place like Venice, that was the trade hub between Europe and the Middle East and Asia and go, no, we're going to bypass you. Nodes are going to start drying up. Maybe, you know, the occasional verbena or other, you know, craft nature worker who isn't near Venice and isn't tied into society at all, they might not notice it, but, you know, your ecstatics, your hermetics, your other order of reason mages who have nodes that are built on the flow and pulse of the city, those nodes are going to suffer directly. Or think, I think it made you can have it be pretty, pretty direct, brutal, systematic responses to something like that. So before Venice was built, you had this landmass, and there may have been a few natural nodes that occurred there at the confluence of the elements or because of a ley line or a dragon nest or whatever you want to posit. But over mm -hmm. time, people are drawn to that initial place, and eventually civilization starts occurring. And now we have a church, we have a library, uh, we have a trade port. And what it sounds like you're saying is there is one interpretation of mage that says there is this node here, people are inspired. And and then there's another way of looking at it. This is it goes the opposite. This is a thriving church community that has allowed a node to form. And that when you take away the trade that has enabled people to live there, those primal nodes tied to the land may remain. But those other nodes and those other locuses of power that were tied to human activity, those are going to dry up. Did I get that arrow of causality acceptable? Yes. Yeah, I think that that really captures it. Okay, so this depends on a notion of prime and 
and what a node is that isn't just... I, I think we, we sometimes get stuck to think that all nodes are cairns and all cairns are nodes. So where werewolves gather as at embodiments of the earth, those are the only nodes. But nodes can be these much wider phenomenon that whenever a large group of people are together and doing a particular thing and investing emotional energy with it, over time a node may open there. Yeah, and I think that's really at the crux of what primal utility is. You know, we mentioned that a little earlier Primal utility is one of the alternate spheres. There are three alternate spheres, primal utility, data, and uh, dimensional science. And primal utility is an alternate for prime. It's kind of in the name. Data is an alternate for correspondence. And dimensional science is an alternate for spirit. They're all technocratic spheres. And really, with the exception of primal utility, they're really just paradigms. I personally have kind of mixed feelings on whether or not they needed to be sphere write-ups, um, but they are. The thing that makes primal utility different is prime talks about nodes from dragon nests, ley lines, whatever you want to call it. Primal utility says human ventures can be nodes. So those are most commonly in the syndicate financial ventures. I started a company, it's a venture. I have a bunch of people coming together their activity produces wealth. Wealth is uh, equivalent for quintessence in this case. I can literally extract quintessence from money because that's my paradigm. And so boom, I have a node. Better, that node doesn't have a location. That node is literally the value of the labor that goes into the venture in aggregate. And this leads to an interesting thing because in first edition mage, the first three conventions that are written up all have an alternative way to produce quintessence. We get in progenitors that it can literally suck the life out of someone, like drinking their breath, as it were, that hospitals have these life webs over them, that people who are near death will have their last ounce of will to live consumed from them, and that can be distilled into quintessence. And then in iteration X, we have people doing incredibly tedious work to do the same thing. And then in New World Order, we get the idea that people People are screaming at their televisions and that can generate quintessence flows. And now we have the syndicate who is like, yeah, the, the strong feelings that arrive around the market and the possibility represented by money itself. The difference between that and quintessence is just one of labeling. So it's kind of fascinating that within the technocracy, we have four different ways of harnessing quintessence that are not a node. And the only group that really spends much time with that general energy are the void engineers, and you have the quillet machine, or however the heck that is pronounced, who just kind of tool around, cleanse nodes, sanitize them, and suck up juice. Yeah, and what's interesting about Syndicate, though, is that those ventures are systematically treated like nodes. You can take them as a background. I have a venture. It is the technocratic equivalent of, well, not the technocratic equivalent, but a technocratic equivalent of the node background. And it, it's interesting in the way that it intersects with like the resources background, because if you have a venture, then of course you should have resources. It's a little bit weird. But the other thing that it opens up that I've used a lot is not just, oh, I have this way to get quintessence, but I understand quintessence flows in terms of these larger organizations. Um, the first time I played a character with primal utility who was not a syndicate mage, he almost joined the syndicate and then went, screw all of you, I'm going to be an orphan. You know, I started looking at kind of the default out of the box rotes for prime. And there was one called roll the bones, where you just disrupt the quintessence flow inside someone's pattern. Oh, rub the bones. Yeah. And, yeah. And I looked at that and I looked at my ST and I went, I have primal utility. I'm going to do that to that business over there. I, You're going to what? <laughs> And so we had to sit and be like, what does that mean? It fundamentally transforms what you can do with a lot of prime. So just to, to explain things, uh, rub the bones is a yeah. prime effect that is you more or less stun someone by wildly varying up and down the quintessence flow through their body. I don't believe it causes actual damage, but you can stun them or at least give them heavy penalties to do just about anything. And you were positing that you could do that to a business. And instead of doing it by changing direct quintessence uh, 
flows of chi, you were you were jostling up and down the resource flows that went into and out of that firm. Yes, correct. I also used it a little bit later in a less directly economic form, but we were attacked by an Anunnaki, and the Anunnaki went into its crawlerling form. But they were, of course, all coordinated. And I, you know, looked at my ST and I made the argument. I understand the quintessence flow between complicated systems. Even though this is a distributed target, I feel like I should be able to do this without a penalty. And the argument stuck. And that kind of effect on a swarm of coordinated spiders that is useless if they can't coordinate was incredibly effective. Um, just, just stepping back and thinking about prime flows across complicated systems as being a single target really makes Prime very powerful. I've met players who are like, that should require entropy. That shouldn't be a standalone sphere. And I can't say I disagree with them. Uh, there is an argument to be made that primal utility is really just Prime plus entropy, except we're not going to make you take entropy. I think there's a solid argument to be made there, but I still like the themes that it opens. So then how do we emulate classic prime effects if we can? So if I want to use the prime effect body of light, which is terribly useful in the Umbra, does that have a primal utility equivalent or alternatively prime four, where I just kind of dispel someone's space quintessence? Are there analogs of that in the primal utility sphere? Oh, this is where things get kind of weird because if you limited primal utility to only organizational quintessence, then the sphere becomes too limited. It doesn't become as dynamic as a true sphere. So you're allowed to use primal utility like normal prime. Basically the, the concept being just because you can understand quintessence across these complicated systems doesn't mean that you can't look at a single node and say, oh, there's value there. I'm going to extract it. If it walks up to an incredibly rich vein of of mystical gold which we'll use as a representation for a node they can still walk up grab a pan pan the gold out and extract the quintessence but really they're going to be at their best when they convince a bunch of other people that in exchange for 10 percent off the top they really want to you know give their labor to the syndicate mage and extract every single bit of gold for a mile underground it doesn't prevent them from doing the first thing though I guess my question is, so I could understand that if there is a node that someone with access to the primal utility sphere could harness quintessence eventually, that they would be able to set up a business that somehow employed this and through its operations to be able to extract. You're saying that they can also do the standard thing of walking around and maybe using TAS. Is that the case? Yes, they can. Um, and this gets into an aspect of mage that is just paradigm in general. So you gave the example of body of light and, you know, and how useful it is in the Umbra. I don't know that someone with the primal utility sphere and just hyper economics, maybe ours competite as their paradigm would be able to do that effect. But it's not that prime prevents that or primal utility prevents that. It's that it doesn't fit their paradigm. And there, there are certain effects where it's just like a syndicate mage isn't going to do that with this sphere. On the flip side, though, the first character I played who had primal utility was I, I sort of took the heavy duty Kabbalah meets economics angle that you kind of get a little bit in the movie Pi, which if anyone hasn't seen it, it's brilliant. It's also a little bit disturbing. It gets into the intersection of economics and mysticism. And he, I specifically designed him to be about, look, we need to get to unity. We need more cooperation among mages. It was beautiful and naive and he never got anywhere. But he could probably have done something like that. And it would have manifested maybe in ways that indicated all the different threads he was pulling quintessence from. Like a pure dyed in the wool syndicate mage? Probably not. That's one of those cases though, where I feel like the syndicate has almost won the Ascension War. I think the best example of that is, sure, you can use correspondence to move a package around the world, but when a syndicate mage does it, their version of correspondence is just using FedEx same day. And people were like, that's not a magical effect. Like, hey, you got something around the globe in like 12 hours. I'm going to call it that. You just didn't incur any risk of paradox whatsoever in doing it because it's mundane. Yeah, I I totally agree. All the syndicate books really emphasize adjustments, which mm -hmm. is what they call rotes. 
and they're all so subtle that they can't possibly be vulgar. The only time the syndicate really runs into paradox is with their global effects because those adjustments overlap on each other until the market busts mm. um, and they're called market corrections. Um, my favorite example is the 2008 crash is listed in the syndicate revised convention book as a paradox backlash. Oh yeah, with Where a big we... old oops next to it. <laughs> <laughs> <You're> like, <laughs> <You> my <know>. bad. <laughs> yeah, and you know, it's described as we tried to give everyone exactly what they wanted and access to everything and no one believed it was possible and pop, you really want us to try and do that again? It was, a, it was an interesting argument. Does the syndicate still function in a world or does primal utility still function if one stops presuming a market? So just for the sake of argument, I will posit the same argument you've all know Marari makes which is markets win out in any case where expertise is distributed and command economies win in cases where information is more efficiently processed centrally. But it is one of those cases where a command economy can get a group of people through a market bottleneck, especially if they have no experience with diffuse networks of trust and trade. Does the syndicate accept or would it allow or could it still exist in a world where all economic questions were centrally answered? I think you have just struck on the entire technocratic union civil war plot. Woo! I win! I mean, um. <laughs> that that is the civil war plot. That is the syndicate constantly technically being on the same side as those ivory tower assholes in the NWO, but not really liking it. So, yeah, I mean, maybe I think that's a future fates thing. Like, okay. what is your vision of the union? Is it truly unified and the divisions are just part of the propaganda or is it really actually kind of internally fractured and the groups don't really get along, but they all have a greater vision. So they put up with each other, like, and how extreme in either of those directions are things. Kind of like in the um, same way that if iteration X were to triumph and everything were to become coldly logical, we would not have the random mutation that powers the progenitors and we would not have the independent thought and inquiry that powers the NWO. Absolutely, yes. So some paradigms do not play well with others. Um, so you, you mentioned global effects. What other global effects do you feel the syndicate doing that we may not even realize are global effects? So I think, as an example, I was actually just watching a documentary, one of the episodes of Explained on Netflix right before we started recording about pandemics. And one of the people they were interviewing was Bill Gates. And I mean who is a better syndicate member than Bill Gates. Yeah, he's known for all of the scientific philanthropy he's doing, but he's not doing the science. He's controlling the money strings. That's what the syndicate does. And, you know, he was talking about why is this important? Why does it matter? And what has been put in place? What are the technologies that have been put in place so we're prepared the next time this happens? And to me, that's a great real world paradigm for what happens on a global scale if we're assaulted from beyond the gauntlet? Because a pandemic disease could be one form of vile spirits forcing their way into our world. And, you know, while the void engineers are primarily responsible for, you know, tracking those sorts of risks and the progenitors would be primarily responsible for creating the magical effects to counter them once they had morphed into a, a biological paradigm on our side of the gauntlet who allows that to be scaled to a global scope the syndicate to an extent the NWO as well in the cdc mold but really a lot of that comes down to syndicate deployed technologies it seems to a large extent then then you are presenting the syndicate as the branch that does not do magic so much as make everyone else's magic mundane well so this gets into an interesting part of their paradigm so there are really or three parts of their paradigm, depending on how you want to look at it. There's the hyper-economics of the market, and then there's the ars capitate, which is the, I'm going to sit down and make a deal with you, and I'm going to understand what you want, and I'm going to get you to want to do exactly what I want to be done. But really, that second part is just the lever to control the machine that is labor. And the word labor doesn't come up because that's a loaded Marxist term in okay. this context. But... One of the major aspects of their paradigm is using other people as their instruments. In M20, one of their major instruments is the HR department. 
the ability to collect the work of others into a magical effect. And primarily they do that with sleepers and extraordinary citizens, but they do it with other mages as well. So it isn't just making the effect mundane. It's about being the coordinating force that takes 12 mages who all kind of want to get the same thing done, but like aren't that organized and being like, boom, I'm going to actually get all of your successes in a single magical effect pool. So two things come to mind. One is the idea that one of the interesting arguments you have that indicate why the technocrats are so successful is that when paradox falls on a technocrat, since they themselves do not believe they are working their magic, but that this device is, the paradox falls on the device. So if I create a, a trans-dimensional portal array and I blow my correspondence dimensional science role, the machine explodes, all the people are safe. It takes me six months to rebuild my focus, but... I'm fine there. Now, it sounds like the syndicate is taking another level of abstraction. Does the syndicate mage consider themselves to be the magical agent within their own paradigm, or are they merely nudging reality and allowing it to play out? Like, to what extent do they believe that they are doing magic, if that makes sense? So, oh, I, I think that the argument of do technocrats really believe they're doing magic is kind of tricky, and how do you want to view that? I personally believe that I sort of use the Sorcerer's Crusade model, where anyone with Enlightenment between one and three has no idea they're doing magic. So a an Enlightenment three syndicate agent knows that they can do extraordinary things, but they honestly just think it's because they have vision. And, you know, if that other person had vision, they could do it too, which there the whole fairy tale of social mobility is born. But once you get to Enlightenment 4, and this is a Sorcerer's Crusade thing, it's never been itemized in modern, but I really like it. But at Enlightenment 4, you cannot avoid the fact that there is a supernatural aspect to what you're doing. Hmm. What you're doing is too huge in scope. You begin to have greater perception of other people's paradigms. And so it becomes unavoidable. So I think a syndicate mage at 2 or 3, who is a manager understands that their role is to create enlightened excellence through the focused potential of their underlings, but they view it the same way a manager. I mean, that's how managers view their value in an organization in the real world. That doesn't need to be magic, even if it technically is in the, in the game. Whereas a syndicate mage at four or five knows they're using magic and they view the people that they are wielding as their instrument. And, you know, you talk about instruments exploding as opposed to the mage, like that sounds like the 2008 crash to me. Who exploded the people doing the work? The one other thing that seems to come out of when I read the rotes for hyper-economics uh, or for primal utility is it seems to be the one sphere that uses results-based rather than process-based determinism. So this is a, a fundamental question in Mage, which says, if I want to cross the town using correspondence three, but without it being vulgar, can I use an effect that allows a taxi to come by, pick me up and transport me getting all green lights, maybe following in the wake of a emergency siren or emergency vehicle that's moving through the town. And now I've used correspondence three to do that because at the end of the day, I move from point A to point B without having to cover the space really in between under my own power. Or is that a mind to correspondence to entropy three effect to do the same thing? So from what you're describing, when I think of hyper-economics, I can use forces three prime two to call someone with a flamethrower. Is that a reasonable way of putting it? It seems like it is very outcome based as opposed to, and the, and the focuses are going to be kind of whatever fits with the resources that a hyper economist would do. I think that's a very valid way to represent their effects. When you were describing that, I was thinking about, I don't know what anime it was, but I saw this like short snippet from an anime that someone posted on the mage group oh God, this would be years ago, the, the Mage Facebook group that I'm a member of. And it was like this guy in a suit and he did crazy anime magic with money. And it was kind of a joke, haha -ha post. Oh, look, the syndicate, if you know they had style. But a certain amount of being able to summon 
you know, like, oh, that's a requisition. I'm going to requisition a person. I'm going to get a contract. And can they do it almost instantly? Whereas in the real world, that's a whole process. Yeah, because it's mage. But I actually really, I like that interpretation of what they do. I think, you know, depending on the game you're running, there could definitely be a slower, more plotting version of that that's that's more distributed and their power comes from scope as opposed to instantaneous effect. But I think there's a scale between it's mage, it's players, we're going to be a little high-flying and unrealistic and just give the aesthetic of, of economics and requisitions. And that's valid and that makes for great play. I also think that makes them more approachable. You know, a lot of people have trouble thinking like, what does their magic even look like? You know, if I can snap my fingers, go into my lift flamethrower app and a lift car shows up 10 seconds later and drops off a guy with a flamethrower who starts attacking my enemies. Man, I would do that in a mage game. That's fantastic. So that's one of those things where it's one of the, it doesn't necessarily look like a magical effect except for the means being, the system being used to generate it are the same. So I am a a syndicate member who has incurred aggravated wounds. So to heal that, I'm going to need life plus prime or what have you to heal that. I channel that effect through my progenitor buddy who is going to be doing it for me. So at the end of the day, it looks like I'm just going to a doctor's office, but this is merely the embodiment of this magical effect that is restoring my pattern. Is that a is that a reasonable way of looking at... I'm trying to think through how you would do certain standard magical effects, as it were, using primal utility and the standard generate a fireball and heal aggravated damage were the ones that kind of came to mind i know aggravated damage i think it's just prime but requires fueled by quintessence i would need to grab how do you do that from behind me yeah i mean i think that really boils down to how comfortable are you stretching your connection to your paradigm because you know, with that, I'm going to channel it through my progenitor buddy. At that point, you know, if it's if it's another mage and it's just you're you're, you're just using one mage to heal you. At that point, it it doesn't feel like hyper economics. Like you're not a manager. You're not you know synergizing and creating more power through the coordination you facilitate. So I, I don't I don't know how satisfying that play effect would be. I like the idea of you know, as a syndicate mage, I can maintain this whole network of extraordinary citizens and I can use primal utility to quickly get them and redistribute them logistics. Like that feels like an effect that's kind of extraordinary. I think there's power in how mundane they can make their effects feel. But I also think there's an importance in creating a dynamic where they just look mundane from the outside. They don't feel mundane to the player using them. That makes sense. I, I think it does. Can you give me a few examples of, we've talked about primal utility by itself. Now, when we look at other things that prime can do, one, it can interface with other effects. Two, prime is usually used to create stuff. Like if I want to create a magical item or a device or a talisman, I need to do that. Does primal utility still allow me to do that? And then what does it look like? So one of the interesting things that they did in the syndicate convention book, which wasn't as novel as they presented it as, is primal utility allows you to imbue people and make people into talismans and wonders through extraordinary training. Basically training them to be part of an efficient part of your system or venture. And so I think, and, and the ability to create a soul flower wasn't unique to primal utility. And I think they, they didn't quite hit the thematic nail on the head there. I think if they'd emphasized it more as with this, you can create networks of soul flowers who collaborate collectively and become effectively a single unit through paradigmatic instruments like scrum masters and Kanban boards and, you know, group training activities and, you know, I, all the things that I do at work every time there's a company meeting. Like I once had a player look at me and scream bingo while I was using buzzwords <laughs> to describe what the mage was doing. But they for, just screamed bingo so I would stop talking. Um, 
But for background, this is something you do professionally. Like you and I have talked about our advocation for the rights of the working person, but at the same time, both you and I more or less work for the syndicate in our own little ways. I'm an actuary for a reinsurance company, and I spend my days trying to figure out how to like reduce losses occurring in America's schools. And you are organizing groups of people to efficiently deliver what your firm does. Like, right? We we know of what we speak when we talk about like the business world and the flow of capital. That's that's the bona fides I'm trying to establish here. And yeah, I think I think that that's absolutely true. And human capital as well as capital capital, like capital C money capital. But the way people get organized is really potent. When I think back to, you know, I work in software. I won't I won't out the company I work for for anything, but I, I work in software. And when I first started, I worked in an organization that was trying to be agile and we were distributed and we weren't really agile. For people that don't know, agile refers to a particular way of organizing software development. That's an incredibly inadequate description, but we're going to go with it for, for these purposes. And the idea being that you move slowly and people have a lot of freedom and you organize and plan in small pieces because when you plan months out, any little thing goes wrong and your plans fall apart. And so why do that to yourself with software? It's necessary if you're building a skyscraper, it's, it's not to develop a feature for a program. And so I was working in this context where we were all trying to be that and none of us really knew how to. And now I work in a context where we are agile and we use hmm, 80 to 90% of the things you're supposed to use or a couple specific pieces of agile we have chosen not to use. But we've chosen not to use them because of the situation we're in and the speed that we create. And I'm not a developer. I'm on the functional side, helping build specs, work with customers to implement all that stuff. But still, I work with the devs so they understand things. Just the organization of like, okay, you are trained, you are focused, you are coordinated, you are working together. For instance, that that piece represents is huge. And that's just me in the mundane world. If you apply that, you know, on top of the magical systems in Mage, it can become pretty monumental if you sort of take that thought experiment to its extreme. And I think that's what primal utility is, is meant to be. So I'm a primal utility player. When do you think I'm going to be at my best? Like, where's the case where I really get to let primal utility shine then? I think you will be at your best in big political investigative games. I think, you know, when you need to uncover a plot in the city, when you need to dig in and find out what supernatural is planning the release of a major pandemic, when, you know, you, you sort of cast the scope of the game a little bit wider and make it less action-based, I think the primal utility player really shines because they have a lot of contacts. They have the ability to get in and inspect, you know, well, what are the expenditure reports for my business that has an intersection with, you know, this other NPC who was nefarious and we need to find out things about. And, oh, they're having an affair with someone so I can look at all of the expenses she's charged and find out things about them because I can use entropy and mind to see the patterns of their affair and where things have happened through these expense reports. I think there are a lot of really exciting things that happen in those sorts of games. Primal utility is tricky when it's just like, I'm in combat and I want this to be a combat sphere. That's the point where you kind of need to switch back and just treat it like prime. Um, and you shouldn't be too restrictive about how you let your players use it. Why do you feel you should err on the side of permissivity? Because it seems like there's a bunch of upsides to it where you uh, you get to more or less super leverage your resources and your allies and your connections and requisitions and so on. Why wouldn't you just prevent that player from doing traditional off-the-cuff prime effects in combat? It depends on the player and it depends on the game because... The thing I've learned with really sort of, I'll say abstract or abstracted powers like primal utility is they sound great on paper, but when you give them to a player, their ability to think at that scale is not always going to be the same. Okay. Um, as an example, I ran a, a convention game where it was the technocracy and I wrote up a syndicate player and I gave them, I put primal utility on their sheet mostly for flavor 
but it was a one shot. I mean, we were in a shoot 'em up. We were fighting things. So I did the sorts of things like rub the bones with the Ananasi in, you know, swarm form that gave that flavor of, of understanding interconnected systems. But ultimately I, I let them do the things they'd be able to do with prime because I was teaching the major as we played the session, you know, I didn't want to be too restrictive. If I'm in a game with a super, super experienced syndicate player and they abuse the farthest reaches of primal utility, I would be much more likely to be legalistic about its boundaries. And I think there's a middle ground there where it's it's a long-term chronicle. The player likes the syndicate, but they struggle to find value and they're they're just working through that. And, you know, I never want to make Mage so legalistic that someone feels chained by Paradigm. Paradigm should feel thematic and it should definitely, you know, prevent you from just abusing the hell out of the spheres. But it shouldn't feel like a straight jacket. And I've I've talked with some people who've played Mage previously, not games that I've run where they described Paradigm that way. And I'm like, I don't know if that's just you or the storyteller you had, but I, I'm always hyper aware that I don't want my players to feel that way. Okay. If I want to introduce primal utility or hyper economics to my game, that is a storyteller I, or player I should keep in mind. Like some fundamental ideas that I should think to myself, my character is going to work differently in this way. You already talked about leveraging networks and investing in people and using that to give supercharged effects that seem mundane. Are there any other maybe non-traditional considerations of primal utility you think people should be aware of? I think one of the biggest things that I would say, and this is true of all role-playing, but if you're going to introduce primal utility, don't just introduce it as cool, you're a player, you have this now. Introduce opportunities in the story where that player is really going to shine. So somebody has somebody has primal utility. They're syndicate, or maybe they're some rare craft mage who's like stolen the knowledge away or discovered it on their own in parallel, however you're introducing it. Throw them up against some NPCs who have ventures and make it impossible for the other players who don't have primal utility to even see the venture for the quintessent source that it is. I think if you introduce the paradigm, giving them some real nice plot cookies and opportunities to use it that way is going to make it feel a lot more vital. And I think, you know, if it's a player who's coming to you and saying, I, I like this idea, but I don't quite know how to make it work. Also really emphasize the need for Ars Cupidite. I think it's easy to look at primal utility and get into the head of like the abstract banker, the invisible exchequer model of the syndicate up in their office, punching away at numbers at a computer and manipulating the world. But realistically, that's a, that's a boring character. Like they exist, they're a huge part of the syndicate, but nobody plays those characters because they're not fun. You're in the field somewhere, whether you're, you know, the syndicate agent who's been assigned to an amalgam to see is your funding worthwhile, but you also have to hold your own because you're going with them on missions. And so, you know, being able to play the emotional side of it, of making people desire to be part of your venture, making your enemies so, or not your enemies, but your, you know, business opponents so infuriated that they misstep, you know, Ars Capitate is a big part of being a good business person. So it sounds like the two resources then for this become one, Swashbuckler's Handbook, which goes over Ars Cupidity in fascinating detail. If you want to force a player to do a charisma plus fencing role, that is the paradigm for you. And the other one is going to be Syndicate Revised. Do, do any wow. other texts give us information? I think those are probably the two most important ones. There's first edition syndicate and it love that book so much. It's very invested in the syndicate as mob organization story, which I think has a place, but it's a little bit difficult to get into playing in the modern world. I don't think it resonates as much as it used to. I can't really think of other books that totally hit that nail. It might be interesting to have that player look at Book of Secrets and look at the section on union discipline, because I feel like in a lot of cases, the syndicate are the are the enforcers. They're the ones who come in and meet out discipline. A lot of times that's okay. You aren't a deviant necessarily, but you're like edging on it. We're defunding you. And what does that mean? Like if you are 
so terrible that we're completely defunding you, but not so terrible that we're executing you. Where does that leave you in the union? You know, when you're in degree four, five, or six, or something like that. Yeah, and so thinking about navigating, maybe having those those bitter agents as a, as opponents, or the syndicate mage who's coming in and defunding your amalgam because you discovered a dark secret about the union. Maybe it's not even that you're bad. I think there's a, a lot of fun potential there. I think the syndicate are pretty central to those dynamics, although certainly the NWO are as well, but in different ways. So those are the best texts to kind of dive into for syndicate content. And I do like that syndicate revised does give players with primal utility, the ability to create gadgets and stable extraordinary devices they just have someone else do it even though they're doing the effect and i think probably the weirdest thing when i was reading up for this is that at level three you can harness the quintessence of somebody dying either specially late raise livestock or employees who literally work themselves to death you are not draining life directly but can seize its power at the moment of death which is not a line i expected to read in a technocracy text but you know what there it is on page 80 no it's not and if you get in but if you get into like the wave of business burnout driven suicides in japan or the earlier industrial dynamics, uh, early capitalism, you know, we don't think about a lot of that today. But even in the modern context, there's a lot of that with in the farm industry in South and Central America, like there are a lot of cases where it's like, yep, I'm just extracting value by working these people to death. And it's it's a bit extreme, but also the world of darkness. Maybe it should be more extreme than our day to day. Yeah. And with that, do you think there are other variants of primal utility that should exist? Like if we are talking about network effects and the ability of people to working together, should my chorister or should my virtual adept union organizer have access to a primal community sphere that can do much the same thing, just harnessing the quintessence that can be generated from a bunch of people working towards a common goal? Absolutely, yes. That's something I've really believed since I first read the Syndicate convention book. Around the time that I read it, I was volunteering at a local co-op in Chicago called Eco, and they had like a small business incubation in their co-op. It was a live-in co-op. A bunch of people lived together. They had a big commercial kitchen. I taught cooking classes there. They also had like a grocery, not exactly a CSA, and it was all done through co-op like reimbursement. So you volunteered, but you also got a percentage of the profits for the thing you volunteered for, depending on what was made. It wasn't true volunteering, but it also wasn't salary. It was a completely, it was an attempt at a completely alternate economic model in microcosm, this little four story building. There are a bunch of those across Chicago or a bunch of those in other cities, but it was absolutely an attempt at primal utility without capitalism, without like capitalist extraction dynamics. And intentionally, like this wasn't by accident. They were attempting to do that. And, you know, arguments to be made about how much that approach scales compared to actual capitalism, but it's absolutely the same sort of effect. And I love the idea that there would be primal utility applied to that. That um, collective was the inspiration for the collective that shows up in the Mage Cookbook. Hmm. I didn't write this section they're included in, but I told the author, Mara Elkhart, about that. We talked through it and she used that for the introduction. So there are ideas there and I've, I've seeded them where I can. Yeah, and, and we talked fundamentally about how economics need not necessarily be a financial venture. It is fundamentally about aligning scarce resources with desire and hyper economics is about recognizing true desire and having a full concept of all possible resources that can be used to sate it, as well as how those desires can be influenced. And that's how you kind of get from economics to hyper economics. So we are not demanding that money in the traditional sense, that, that paper currency or uh, or hard currency be involved, but that we are using uh, the manipulation of non-standard resources to ameliorate want. And that can show up in any number of paradigms in any number of ways. And that gives you a bunch of opportunities on how to change the prime sphere. Absolutely. You and I spoke before then, and I had asked, is the Hoover Dam a technocratic device or is it an example of a ritual? And your answer was yes. 
And in this case, it seems like that would quickly come from the idea of using primal utility to be the resource management that coordinates everyone and kind of gets this machine, in this case, the organizational machine of building an entire dam up and running. Am I interpreting that right? Or is there more going on there than just getting a dam out the other end? Oh, I think I think you are interpreting that right. And I think the Hoover Dam is a good model. I mean, there is the ritual to create the device. So if we think about let's say the the great pyramids are a necromantic device and they you know are are channeling energy from from the dead pharaohs and will com- compare all of those magic effects to the hoover dam you know there's the ritual to create the device itself to build it and the slaves that went into the pyramids and then the people who were actually compensated to build the hoover dam and that's a whole argument but so there's all this work and coordination which would probably require primal utility in either of these examples or some version of it to get the thing built. Cool, now I have my wonder, but you still need to use the wonder. So I think there's the ritual to build the thing. Then you have the device that was built by that ritual. And then there's the ritual to leverage it, you know, and the ongoing rituals to contain and focus the energy of the pharaohs and and connect to the underworld in the case of you know, the pyramids and on the side of the Hoover Dam, you have ongoing ritual to extract electricity, to use this device to transform the flow of water into lights being turned on in, you know, thousands of households and businesses within range of the Hoover Dam. And there's a continued ritual using that wonder in the same way that a mage still picks up a wonder and utilizes it using their practice and their paradigm. They don't have to make full seer rolls because the device is, is empowered enough to sort of take that on, but still takes a practice and a ritual and an implementation. And I think the Hoover Dam is just that scaled up to primal utility venture kind of scale. We could talk about the magic that is that centralized system, but also in mage terms, if I want to treat the Hoover Dam as a device, that is now a perfectly good device for high-end forces or correspondence effects. I tap the energy from the Hoover Dam directly to lower the dimensional barrier or allow for to create a Schrodinger gateway or alternatively in an emergency to cause a scheduled disruption to the power grid, which allows me to seemingly do a force lightning bolt out of the open but near a high transmission line to uh, to drop some forces pain on someone. So it is both functioning as a a device in the the magical sense, but also as a focus to, I guess you could say, the rituals of modernity. Yes. Yeah, I like that. I like that turn of phrase. This has been pretty fascinating in that I started with a somewhat blurred conception of the line between an adjustment and mundane reality. And with a conversation where you're like, oh no, the Hoover Dam, that's a device too, blurs it even further. So despite the fact that I do a mage podcast, things make maybe less sense than when I started and I appreciate that. Is there anything else that you're you're working on or any uh, parting considerations you'd like our audience to have before we uh, wind up our conversation? I am working on a couple things, but unfortunately the, the day job that we mentioned is consuming a really outsized portion of my life right now. So, and uh, there are a couple episodes of Walking Away from Arcadia that should be coming out. So I'm excited to, to get a couple more episodes of that out in the world. I'm pretty jazzed about it. And I hope we can have you back when uh, Victorian Mage is actually out in the wild. Uh, Victor, thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure. You've been listening to Mage the Podcast. If this is your first episode or you haven't subscribed yet, you can subscribe to our show on Spotify, Anchor, TuneIn, iTunes, Google Play Podcasts, or the podcatcher of your choice. If you do, you'll get a toasty new episode each and every week until we decide that we are completely tired of this. Our audience grows through personal recommendations, so if you know someone who'd like it, pass it on or leave a review on iTunes. We have a hop in Discord community at discord.me slash maidsthepodcast, and you can also give us your thoughts and feedback over email at maidsthepodcast at gmail.com or on Twitter at Mates of the Podcast. This episode is made possible from the support of our executive producers, and recently I've been giving them stupid nicknames, but today I'm going to try something different. Originally, I wanted to play the song Testerosis for Everyone, which is a hop and mix of Alice DJ and R. Kelly under the audio as I read everyone's name, but I couldn't get the okay from the creator. So here's some generic chanting I found on a royalty-free music site. Our executive producers are Brendan, Andrew, 
John Magnuson, Justin, Anders, Michael Parker, Richard Bat Brewster, and Bryce, I promise to have you on Darker Days Radio One Day, Terry Perry. Huh, that's a weird middle name. But sure, I'd love to. If you'd like to support us and get a cool chat color in Discord and have me make up a fake name or whatever dumb promo I decide, go to magethepodcast.com and click on Become a Supporter of Mage the Podcast. Also go to magethepodcast.com for show notes and all our previous shows. Bye. <laughs>